sorts of areas. It's like a one-stop shop for NGOs in terms of if you have issues around governance, you want to understand things around funding, or you want to understand things around networking, or, or just capacities that NGOs need. So Hugh was going to talk to us this morning about fundraising, because it's something that's coming up a lot, as I said this morning. You know, we have a good partnership, and then how do we fund our activities? So as you're listening to the presentation, I'd invite you all to really just think about your own situation, whether you're starting a partnership, whether you are looking to develop a, a pilot on, on a particular activity, and seeing what you can take from, from Hugh's presentation that might be relevant to yourself. And then we will make this presentation available afterwards. Thank okay. you. Thanks, uh, Nadine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to, uh, basically I'm going to go through three things this morning. I'm going to show you just some ideas of where funding can come from. Uh, I'm going to give you sort of a, a, a rough outline of a 10-step strategy on how to develop an actual plan in your funding space, and then maybe we'll just do a few hints and tips on writing uh, grant proposals and all the rest of it. But before I do all of that, um, I just want to get a sort of a feel for all of you guys in the room. So how many of you, first of all, we'll ask the, the easiest question first, how many of you fundraising or funding, fund, uh, writing funding applications as a full-time job? Hands up. How many people uh, do it willingly? <laughs> how many people do it reluctantly? There you go, hands are going up. And how many people have never done it at all? Okay, so there's a few people in here who have never done it at all. Anybody who, who's done it either willingly or reluctantly, can you just sort of give us an idea? Have any of you funded or, 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 you know, you've been in your partnerships, I believe, for over 10 years now. Have you been successful in getting funding for your partnerships in the past? Or does anybody want to talk about that? Go, go ahead there, I saw a hand go up. So we organized a series of events, and we collected a huge amount of money and went from simple things like uh, uh, sales work to, to, to uh, poker nights to race nights. I mean, gambling really on the pin, but not the money. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and we had a, a huge number. Of local, we involved the branches locally, and we made a national drive. Excellent. And we raised uh, enormous amounts of money. nurses we identified with you know the same one the tragedy of it all. Yeah. And and we knew how critical they were for their health service. Yeah. You, you get in I have a slide later but so I'm, I'm going to destroy my, my later slide by actually responding to you. Uh, and saying that it's it's interesting that human beings, as human beings, we respond when asked, you know. And we, like it, it, it's a everybody seems to hate funny, like the amount of hands that went up for reluctance. Uh, you know, and we hate to do it. We hate to ask people for funding. We hate to ask people for money. And yet, time and time again, we've proven that when people are asked and when people, you know, connect at that very human level, they respond and they respond magnificently, particularly here in Ireland, but obviously uh, internationally as well. So, so look, we'll we have a little bit of a chat. The one thing I will say is I've about 45 minutes to go through everything, uh, and there is a lot to get through, so I probably will sp speak at you and at speed and all the rest of it. Um, but equally, there's two good things in relation to the presentation, that everything that I'm going to show you is available in a link to a downloadable uh, booklet um, that I'll show you. Um, so if I don't get through everything, it's fine. So please, the best thing you can do over the next 45 minutes is interrupt this mouth from speaking too much. Uh, and, and certainly ask as many questions and put your hand up and let's have it a little bit more interactive than just me talking for 45 minutes. I am from Tipperary. If I have time left at the end, I will talk about Liam Sheedy and our chances in uh, the other <laughs> six year. So do interrupt me to save yourselves from that. Um, okay, just a little introduction. Uh, uh, the Wheel, does everybody here know who The Wheel are? Yeah. Does anybody not know who we are and go, who the hell are you? Oh, there you go, a few hands up. Basically, we're a national representative body for the community voluntary charity social enterprise space. Um, we represent and support these organisations and try help them uh, to make Ireland a more fair and just place for us all. We have roughly 16 to 1,700 members. I think it's close to 1,700 now. Um, and, and we represent a 
quite a variety of organisations. This just it's just a sort of a, 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 by example more than anything else. Twenty one of our largest members have a combined turnover of over one billion uh, euros, and yet our smallest four to five hundred members have a combined turnover less than uh, sixteen million. So we represent, and the sector is representative of very very large service delivery organisations, primarily in the health space, also education and a few other spaces like that, all the way through to local volunteer run uh, small local community groups and activities. So quite a diverse sector uh, and our, I suppose our membership is quite a diverse representation of that as well. Um, I, first thing I'm going to ask just in question is uh, how many sources of funding are there? So you were talking there and you mentioned about 10 different things, mainly gambling, it seemed you have a, a habit, but uh, the, um, the, the, um, how many sources of funding and fundraising do you think there are, give or take? More than 50? More than 100? More than 500? What if I told you there's only four? Would you believe me? There's, there's only four. Look, uh, general sources of funding. Basically, this is a good model to think about how you do your funding. Obviously, there's loads of different types of things that you can do in any one of these four areas. But the, the, the way to think about um, how your funding is structured or how you go about your funding is really in these four quadrants. And really, this is courtesy of NCBO, the Sustainable Funding Project. They're like the equivalent of the wheel over in England uh, and they have a very good uh, set of resources called Know How Nonprofit. One of the resources they do is around sustainable funding. Uh, and they talk about the fact that there's only really four areas of funding, gifts, grants, contracts, and open market. And really, you're on a continuum from asking to earning. And the idea here is not so much what the source of the funding is, you know, is it you know, from a corporate, is it from this, is it from that, which is how we normally think about funding. But it's about the relationship you have with that funder. So if you're looking for a gift, the relationship you're going to have is with a donor. If you're looking for a grant, you're applying for a grant, that relationship is a funder. If it's a contract, like a tender or something like that, you're getting into a more formalised sort of contract arrangement with a purchaser, and then obviously open market, and the traditional sort of open market example would be something like setting up a charity shop or something along those lines, and then that relationship is with the consumer. And, and the reason why that's interesting is because if you know the relationship that you have from the source of funding or fundraising that you're going to do, it changes the way you, or hopefully will change the way or influence the way you speak to those people. Like one of the examples that I would give you in terms of the wheel is that as a membership organization with organizational members, um, when we were talking about how our, our, you know, what we do for our membership, we're very service-led, we're very sort of you know, service priority. And a number of years ago, we started talking to the rest of our, our, our team and sort of said, well, look, at, when you actually ask our membership, you know, uh, why are they members of the wheel? An awful lot of our members, or at least a third of our members, were members of the wheel because they supported what the, the, the organisation did. So I sort of made the point, I said, they're not you know, consumers of our services, they're actual donors. Do you know what I mean? So we need to change and adopt our language to put them at the heart of what we do and to talk to them in a way that they feel that they're supporting. They, they join to support a representative body for the sector and we need to put them at the heart of feeling that they're doing that. So our language changed uh, and we adopted our language to that. So it's just worth thinking about. Just going to run through some of the funding options. This is a very much a whistle-stop tour, but it's just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that's out there. First of all, obviously, there's an awful lot of funding in the um, research and engaged research space. Uh, there's that Ireland Research and Development Funders report which was done a number of years ago. Um, Enda Kenny is the Taoiseach's address on the front of it, so that can tell you it's a little bit out of date. Um, uh, and then there's obviously the Engaged Research Report as well, which was produced by Maura Adshead, uh, which again is more about how to do engagement and, and all this sort of stuff, whereas this is all about the funders. It's still fairly relevant, and as I said, there's an awful lot of uh, funding out there in the research space, which is good in terms of collaborations on health issues and health partnerships. Then some of those potential partners, you probably know all of these already, but you have Science Foundation Ireland, you have the Health Research Board, you have the Irish Research Council, you have then organisations like the Health Research Charities Ireland, which is a collaboration similar to yourselves in, uh, the, in the health research space, and they have a collaboration uh, or a joint funding scheme with the HRB, and then obviously you have uh, Irish Aid and the Overseas Aid uh, Development Funding and things like that. So quite a, a smorgasbord of things there. Other things then in the sort of the sort of philanthropic space, uh, set up in 2015, you have what's now called the Social Innovation Fund. It was established by the government uh, when uh, Chuck Feeney, who some of you may know from Atlantic Philanthropies, when Atlantic Philanthropies were spending out all of their funding up to 2017, 
what the Irish government did was establish a social innovation fund with an idea to encourage more philanthropy in Ireland. And what they do is that if a philanthropist uh, donates a, a, a fund uh, to the social innovation fund, then the Irish government will match it. So if you put a million euros into supporting sport, uh, the Irish government will match that with a million euros from their own funds. And there's quite a number of funds there uh, in various different areas. The ones that might be relevant to yourselves, there's youth education, uh, 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 children and youth, there's a few sort of in the, the health and youth and well-being space. Uh, and the main thing really here in terms of this organisation is that they've been established in, in 2015 and they've already set up 14 different funds uh, in the last three to four years. Um, there's a lot of European funding out there that obviously would be right. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Going back to the last slide, you yeah. mentioned, is it within Ireland or outside Ireland? Is it funding for organisations just inside? Um, it's funding, yeah, you have to be an Irish organisation to apply for the funding, but my understanding is that they fund the programme and the idea, not necessarily that you know it's restricted to you know geographic boundaries or things like that. But it would depend on the fund. So um, Brazilian Communities Fund, for example, was Tomer Trust in Cork, and uh, the, who set up that fund uh, with the Social Innovation Fund, and they had a specific interest in Irish communities for the Resilient Communities Fund and developing resilient programs within Irish communities. And actually, they had a bias towards Munster, so there you go. But um, uh, you know, but but that was all part of the thing. Uh, so it, it 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 largely depends on the funder for the philanthropic funder and their criteria matched with the, the government's criteria, but certainly some of them will qualify, but not all. Uh, European funding, as I said, there's an awful lot of European funding out there. If you log on to our website on that, location European funding opportunities, down here, accessing EU funds 2015 and beyond, is a report that was done by Professor Hugh Quigley. Uh, basically, there's around about 450 funding instruments through the European Union. Um, uh, it would take us all a lifetime to go through them all. So what uh, Professor Quigley did, helpfully did, was he, he sort of went, assessed all of them and went through the top 25 or 30 that are most relevant to community and voluntary groups, charity, social enterprises, that sort of stuff, and put them all into a very good report. So it's sort of like your, your fast track uh, to sort of, you know, what uh, EU funding sources are out there and what they fund. Obviously within the EU, similar to the Irish aid, there is the international development aid area as well. And the other thing I would say as well is that we do have the European Programs Manager in the wheel, her name is Deirdre Finley. She's actually the national contact point for a programme called Europe for Citizens, which may not be relevant to you, but just D is very good in the European space. So if you ever have any questions about European funding, European programmes, don't ask this mug here, ask that mug there. Um, uh, Lergos, uh, again, I always like to give them a plug uh, for two reasons. First of all, anything in the vocational education training space, some of the partnerships I was here before the break and was listening to some of the things uh, that you're doing with, in, with partnerships overseas, there will be a, 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 a large transfer of knowledge and expertise and all that sort of stuff. And Lergos uh, is the national agency that looks after the Erasmus funding programs uh, and, and anything to do with vocational education and training. Again, I wouldn't necessarily be up to date in terms of you know whether Erasmus funds outside of the European Union or not. I know it funds an awful lot of partnerships within the European Union, because uh, that's the area I'd be most familiar with, but certainly worth asking. I always give them a plug anyway, because they're the type of organisation that has an awful lot of good staff who will actually sit down, talk to you, go through what you, you can and can't apply for, and they're just very, very good people to talk to, uh, and very, very useful. In the same vein, I always put these guys up as well, which again, not everything on this will be relevant to, you, to your partnerships, but just Pubble as an organisation, they have 23 programmes, they have 650 million that they dole out. They do obviously do stuff through the HSE as well. The areas are early years and young people, inclusive employment and enterprise and social inclusion and equality. And again, the reason why I always mention them is because similar to Lergos, they have a good staff of about 50 and they are always seem to be on hand. Now, people might turn around to me and complain and say, oh, I contacted the public once and this happened, didn't happen or whatever. That may be the case. But uh, more often than not, and certainly my own personal experience is that they have good people in there who will sit down and actually give you a half an hour to chat through what might, you might and might not qualify for and where to go looking for extra funding. Um, the other one then, of course, which I've said the best to last, is the Esther Ireland themselves have a grants round uh, for health partnerships of eight to 10,000 euros each. So I don't know if any of you have availed of that here in the room. If you have, um, obviously, you know, keep it all to yourselves. Uh, and uh, if you haven't, uh, you know, try and accost those people who have been successful in the room and find out how they did it uh, over the break. Okay.
Okay. Uh, so what's out there? Uh, basically what's out there, we, we have a service called Funding Point. Uh, and what we do is we employ a human being, his name is Paul, um, uh, to do an awful lot of research on what funding grants and things are available and that are out there. We put it up on this service called Funding Point. Uh, funding Point is not uh, funded through the government. Uh, there's no government funding, there's no statutory funding to support it. So unfortunately it is a subscription service, so, so it's a paid for service, so we ask people to subscribe to the service. So it is behind a paywall, so that's the, the downside. Um, but equally, there's 851 opportunities up there that, that uh, have been researched and put up there. An awful lot in the local government space, but then statutory trust foundations, European Union, central government, lots and lots and lots there. Um, the one thing I would always say is just look at this. You know, at any given time, there's only about one third or a quarter of them that are open. Most uh, funding rounds will be closed because they're only open for uh, periods of time or whatever. Um, but there's around about 200 open. We generally find, in terms of our uh, people who avail of it and those who are currently subscribed to it, around about a dozen to a, uh, two dozen uh, funding opportunities would be relevant to most organisations in a given year, depending on what your criteria are and what you're, you're looking for. But very, you know, somewhere, you know, somewhere in the region of a dozen to two dozen would become available that you could apply for in the year. And we find in most organisations, if they take a proactive approach to applying uh, on a regular basis, um, you know, they'll generally be successful in two to three of, of, of those. Sorry, uh, how much is the sub? How much how the much subscription is, is uh, 125 euros per annum, but I think it's 100 euros for the first year. Um, uh, and that's to members, and then there's a non-member rate as well. Uh, and just, here's the cheat. Um, so, you know, uh, don't tell anybody I showed you this slide, although I believe we're being recorded. Um, <laughs> the, the, this is what, there's 330 funders on uh, funding point. That's, I, I, I got tired of screen grabbing, so this is what 160 of the 330 funders look like. And it's just interesting because there's just organisations that you might, might never have considered even researching. Like, I, I love this one, the Lucy Gelbankian Foundation, you know, mm -hmm. the new they existed, you know, uh, Bernard Sunley Charitable Foundation, you know, Global Health Council, that would be relevant, you know, 3M United Kingdom, West Mead, BEC, like there's loads of different funds out there that you might not necessarily have thought about. Mm -hmm. So the key takeaways here is that there's more out there than you might realise. We do have a, re a database of research already done, so don't waste your time doing it again. And then, you know, start local, think about what's available here in Ireland, and then spread regional, national, and into EU and various different other spaces. Uh, any quick questions on that? Just one yes. of you, just regarding if a body wanted to de develop a structure that would partner with, say, Ireland and a group in, say, Africa, yeah. to qualify for funding here in Ireland, does the legal structure need to be registered in Ireland? Um, 99% of the time, yes, but it would depend on the fund. Irish Aid would actually give you better advice, or maybe even Doak is a representative for overseas development agencies, uh, and they specifically focus on that, because I'm quite sure there are certain foundations and trusts out there that wouldn't need, need that requirement, but I'd be fairly confident that most statutory agencies and most you know, state aid agencies and European Union funding would require a registered legal entity somewhere, certainly you know, in, in Ireland, preferably if it's an Irish fund, and within the European Union if it's a European Union funding because it would sort of almost defeat the purpose of handing funding out to organisations that are not registered. Plus, once you get it into the overseas area and the NGO area, overseas development, you start hitting into all these anti-terror legislation issues and, and all that sort of problems. So they're very, very strict of making sure that they have registered entities, um, that they know that the, the money has been channeled through, you know? So, so just be aware of that. And, any other questions? Okay, just a few quick slides again on partnering with corporates. Um, just be aware that there is, the government has uh, set up through the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation a whole area on CSR uh, and best practice on CSR and the four dimensions of CSR, which is the workplace, the community, the environment and the marketplace. Um, and CSR, can you just elaborate? So, sorry, corporate, so, sorry, CSR is corporate social responsibility. So most corporates should have some form of a corporate social responsibility strategy uh, and the Irish government is doing its best to encourage more and more corporates in Ireland to have proper uh, corporate uh, 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 social responsibility strategies. Um, so just be aware that that's there, there are resources there available. And I suppose the one thing about it is that in terms of looking at the forums and who are the stakeholders and attending the, the various different CSR forums from the CSR hub, it gives you a good idea of you know what co companies and corporates are active and relevant uh, in, in the spaces or that you might be uh, relevant to. 
Obviously, uh, Dave already mentioned the, the SDGs. Ireland has its own SDG uh, program uh, and a national implementation plan. It has a forum. How many people here would attend the SDG stakeholder forum or be aware of it? Okay, one or two. Okay, good. Because there's like there's a lot of people. It's a totally open forum. There's an awful lot of various sectors. Obviously, most of the organisations attending the stakeholder forum are members of what's called Coalition 2030, which is a coalition of civil society organisations. Um, but there's an awful lot of corporates out there. And then I suppose you can start to do a little bit of research and you start to find, oh, dear, really, please. You start to find uh, sustainable organisations that are talking a lot about sustainability issues and the SDGs. And I just did a screen grab of two AIB have been out there talking a lot about sustainability at the moment. And then there's this one, who are a packaging company, IPL, uh, and I came across them doing my own research not so long ago, and they're putting their entire strategy around the SDGs and sustainable development goals. So again, in terms of what you're doing in the SDGs and the overseas space and partnership space, um, you know, start to find corporates or start to identify what corporates are talking big in this space uh, and, and, and interested in this space and are looking for collaborations in this space as well. Yeah. I couldn't possibly comment. Um, but no, like I, I, I genuinely believe, uh, genuinely, just like, uh, what's her name? Uh, Miriam. Uh, Miriam. But uh, that, you know, everybody is taking, in the last year, climate action has become a massive issue. And I think an awful lot of corporates are waking up to the fact that they need to do more. Um, what I find in terms of my attendance at the SDG stakeholder reform is the people who go out for, first in this space have actually been the energy companies. So your, your air tricities and um, you know, energies and all those sorts of guys, they've been big in this space uh, you know, quite early on. The main reason being that they'll start to hit penalties in terms of not reducing energy consumption uh, targets. So they have a, 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 a stick as well as a carrot to do it. Um, so there is, you know, I mean, I, I can't speak specifically for AIB, but like what I would say is that I think corporate Ireland um, and just corporates in general, are starting to wake up to the fact that you know the climate issue is massive and therefore this they you know, they they have a role to play in terms of sustainability and, and and they have a role to play in terms of talking more and being more proactive around sustainability in terms of where the focus for their actual customers are so yeah obviously there's a business interest or a, a business protection interest in that um there always would be but equally i actually think you know it's, it's fairly genuine in fairness to AIB, just I do know that they've hired, or they've um, somebody uh, quite senior in Ulster Bank came over to become their director of sustainability. So they've, they've put quite a senior level in uh, in the sustainability space. Um, but yeah, you know, we all can be cynical sometimes so about the Sorry? You go with the quid pro quo. Yes, yes. And the other thing I would say as well is that the SDG champions, they've launched 12, there's four or five of them that are uh, corporate uh, SDG champions. So, you know, they would be the perfect partners if you're doing something in the SDG space to say, look, it's, you know, we'd love to partner with you guys and we know you're an SDG champion. They can't say no to you. They have to at least meet you for coffee if, the, if uh, they, they, um, they, they're in the SDG space as well. The other areas, and again, these are just examples, as well as those types of uh, companies, there are companies you might never even have heard of or thought about. Irish public bodies are an insurer uh, for most of the local authorities in Ireland. And a number of years ago, they decided to set up a community fund and put five million euros into it. And they divided that five million into five lots of a million. Um, and one of those lots actually ended up being the social enterprise fund that went into uh, Social Innovation Fund Ireland. So it became a two million social enterprise fund. So, you know, again, every day you'll come up or you'll be introduced to a new corporate somewhere that you haven't really thought about. Coca-Cola Thank You Fund, they've been giving away 125,000 euros every year for the last number of years. You know, uh, Glasgow Smith Klein have an impact awards program. There's loads of them out there. These are just examples. But the thing that I always say in this space is that, you know, don't just think of the obvious. Don't just think of sort of the, the, the corporate grant. When people start thinking about partnering with a corporate, they inevitably sort of think of the high street and think of the, you know, the banks and the, all that sort of stuff. And the thing that I always say is, well, you know, Think about you know the stuff around that. Like like not everybody works on the high street, um, and you know people work in you know an awful lot of people work in very boring sheds uh, in in uh, industrial estates and are just dying for something to do. And the example that I give you actually comes from Freud. Uh, Freud's office is based out in City West, 
uh, which, you know, if you know that area, I mean, they're just surrounded by an industrial estate. Uh, and I was doing this presentation, or I, I had this slide in a presentation a number of uh, years ago, and I said that. I said, think a little bit, you know, sometimes it's better to actually walk around an industrial estate with a, a pen and a clipboard and start talking to corporates uh, in there or start talking to businesses there than it is to start sending out a load of uh, emails or, or whatever to corporates. And, and she said, so you're absolutely right. She said, we went to go around our industrial estate every year. She said, we went into some, I don't know, warehouse of some description. There was a guy in there uh, and he jumped at the chance to, to talk to her when they went in and had a chat at reception. And he was an avid cyclist, very, very keen on it. He decided to do a sponsored cycle for uh, for Oiga. He'd been doing it, that was about five years. He'd been doing it for about 12 years at that stage. And he was doing a fundraiser. The fundraiser was bringing in about 7,500 euros a year uh, from this uh, sponsored cycle. It's just from this one conversation with this one guy. So they generated you know, 75,000 to 100,000 euros just from this one relationship, just by going in the door and having a chat. So again, um, the idea here is that you know, don't, if you're thinking about partnering with various different corporates, um, don't just think about uh, you know, the, the obvious. The other one that I give an example of is the Dublin Airport Authority. Uh, the lady who was the head of corporate social responsibility there, I heard her speak in an event, and she was talking about the, the organisation Bumblance. Have you heard of Bumblance? Yeah. They're a charity that uh, provides uh, ambulance services to, to sick children. And um, uh, at the time, the uh, Bumblance total fundraising, uh, you know, wasn't even a six-figure sum, uh, and they had one uh, one ambulance on the road. And uh, they there was a lady who was a staff member in Dublin Airport Authority. They put a sign up in the canteen and said, "Nominate your charity." This lady had some personal, you know, experience or otherwise through a family member or friend of Pop Bumblins did thought they were amazing. Nominated them. They came in. They presented the charity committee. They were uh, chosen as one of the three charities, and they ended up going from having a total fundraising of less than you know six figures uh, in total from the previous year to having a six figure, a healthy six figure sum each year for the next two or three years just from this one partnership with the Dublin Airport Authority. So the key thing here is to start to think about getting a committee together of whoever's involved in your partnerships. You know, if you have get ten people to give you twenty names each, that's two hundred names, uh, and, and and start to sort of you know put, put things out there. So find businesses close or local to, to your community or organisation or partnership. Try to get a friend or family member.